A little birdie told me you want to be a special snowflake and prove everybody wrong. It also told me you like to be smashed in the face like really hard and then sucking <coughs> your way back to full HP with your own personal kit and making healers feel awkward about their healing meters. Hmm. Well, in that case, then Blood Decay is the perfect <coughs> tank for you in 8.3. Stay tuned because in this video we will go over the talents, essences, gear, rotation and a lot more things so you can get some solid hands-on tanking experience with the best tank in the game the broom as the blood decay in nihilotha a quick disclaimer this guide was made in collaboration with mandel and the accurate discord channel the community of blood decays also make sure that you keep in mind this is the beginning of the patch so the meta will probably change as we progress to the next couple of months to stay updated with the spec, hop onto our Discord, or better yet, hop onto the Accurate Discord channel and keep in touch with the best blood decays in this side of Azeroth. On this side of Azeroth. That is how people talk. Cheers! The talents haven't really changed since last patches. Blood needs some reworking or buffing since certain ones are pretty much mandatory. On the first row, take Blood Drinker when raiding. It adds sustain, single target damage and can be used while moving which will happen a lot when tanking bosses. You can also cast Dancing Rune Weapon while you channel the spell. In dungeons, Heartbreaker will be the alternative specializing you in AoE fights making your heart strike generate even more runic power when striking additional targets. Runic power is a resource but also the mitigation enabler for death strikes so managing it is essential in tough packs. Second row for both raids and dungeons take hemostasis. This talent makes sure blood boil apply a stacking buff per enemy hit each stack increasing the damage and healing of your next death strike by 8% stacking up to 5 times. This will become especially handy in AoE situations, although still the best single target option on the row. You can be smart about this one and manage it as long as you are not wasting any resources in doing so. Next on the list is Ossuary, again for both raids and dungeons. Ossuary gives you Death Strike, a runic power cost reduction if you have at least 5 stacks of Bone Shield on you, on top of 10 extra runic power to your max runic power cap. The effect essentially makes every 9th Death Strike be free, mathematically, and if you think this is unimpressive for a talent, well, <laughs> it's still the best on the row. Moving down, we have Will of the Necropolis, the de facto option for raids and dungeons alike. This baby makes you take 30% less damage while below 30% health. This talent is essentially what we would like more healers to know about. 30% damage reduction is no laughing matter and that just means you have more time to heal yourself up either through death strikes or through your healer's abilities. It's not recommended to play and get the most out of this one but it's important you are aware of it and not panic when you dip low and waste cooldowns. The more you will be pushing yourself tackling tough content the more useful this talent will become. One thing to understand about it is that any damage that occurs when you are below 30% HP will be mitigated, even if that damage is part of a single bigger hit that would strike you while above 30%. It would deal the normal damage until it takes you to the wall of Will of the Necropolis threshold, after which the rest of the damage is reduced by 30%, if this makes any sense. Next row is finally one with options. When raiding, you want Wraith Walk, hands down. There are a whole bunch of mechanics that will force you to move from A to B, and it's no secret that Death Knights are one of the classes that drew the short end of the stick when it comes to mobility. This paired up with Death's Advance will satisfy your mobility needs in almost all situations. When doing Mythic Plus Dungeons, you want to swap to Grip of the Dead. This will transform your Death and Decay into a utility slash defensive ability. When the mobs enter the Death and Decay area, they will be slowed by 90%, the slow decaying by 10% consistently for the duration of the effect. One of the most important uses of this is to give you the ability to kite the pack even for a few seconds while your healer gets you back up. The difference between using this properly or not can make or break a very high key you are attempting. 
Second to last row has Bloodworms as the best option. Both raids and dungeons benefit the most from this on the sixth row. There isn't much for you to manage here since it all happens passively, working into one of your strongest self-sustained mechanics. The way it works is made to assure that you don't die since the worms burst when you are taken below half HP to heal you for a decent chunk. Lastly, we have the 7th talent row. In raids and mostly single target situations where you want to optimize self-sustain uptime, take Red Thirst. This will essentially give you more vampiric blood throughout the fight. Otherwise, take Bone Storm in both raids and dungeons. It adds AoE damage and healing back and works the best with multiple targets. This raid here, we have more than one target on a lot of the fights, so you can use it more than you would have last patch. The reason we are not considering Purgatory is due to a faulty interaction where it can sometimes bug out with the will of the Necropolis and end up killing you instead of preventing your death. Until that is fixed, we recommend not using Purgatory since it can sometimes work, sometimes won't. When gearing your blood decay, if all you have to go on are raw stats, no corruptions or sockets, although sockets can still mean stats, you want eye level above everything else. All stats are good, and even if not 100% equal, they are good enough where eye level will be your main determining factor here. After that, you want versatility next when raiding, followed by the rest of the stats. Versatility will give you the most rounded power balanced with defensive ability, especially in this tier where magic damage seems to be a big part of the damage you take. In dungeons, after eye level, you want critical strike and very closely after versatility with the rest at the bottom. Versatility has the same argument as before. Crit, however, can eke a bit higher since it gives you parry chance and more damage. Your death strike seals cannot crit though, which is a shame, but fighting large packs of mobs makes parrying more efficient. As such, when you pick your consumables, you align them with your stats and content that you are doing. To keep it simple, aim at versatility, enchants and gems, but feel free to replace them with their crit counterparts when doing high keys and if your crit rating is considerably lower than your versatility in dungeons. Your weapon in general will always be Rune of the Fallen Crusader. It's free and really it's the strongest option in the game. 6% HP heal and 15% bonus strength every time it procs is pretty self-explanatory. Your flasks and potions will be strength oriented if you want to keep things simple. For pure single target DPS output, you can replace the strength potion with the potion of unbridled fury and on four or more targets with potion of empowered proximity. Eat feasts for your food buff if present since the strength buff is universal and at most a marginal loss or gain compared to a secondary stat food buff, which can easily be built tongue if you do not have access to feasts. Keep in mind that stats can change depending on what corruption affixes you are running. When deciding on your Azerite pieces, blood has actually a very weird priority. The actual blood traits are incredibly undertuned and as such will almost never be a deciding factor over which Azerite to pick. So in order of their importance, here is what you need to look for when picking your Azerite pieces. Look for Resounding Protection or Impassive Visage or Vampiric Speed. These are minor traits focused on defense. They scale well with versatility and have an overall larger impact on you than anything else. The next thing to look for are middle traits like Overwhelming Power, Gut Ripper and Heed My Call. These focus on damage instead, with Heed My Call being specifically good in AoE. These aren't more important than the defensive ones, but definitely more important than the actual blood traits. Next, you finally look at the main rings, mostly for generic stat traits like Meticulous Scheming and Heart of Darkness. And if you have no more options, you can opt for Blood Decay traits like Bloody Rune Blade and Bones of the Damned, which are the two slightly better traits than the rest of the blood-related options. You mostly want them for their unstackable effect, but in the lack of better options, you can end up stacking them. Although the priority is a bit weird, there have been some maths and tests and numbers behind all of this, working out how good all of the traits are, so trust in the power of someone else's brain. Uh, no, not mine, definitely not mine. 
For the essences, the most consistent major option you can go for is Crucible of Flame for both raids and dungeons. Similar to traits, all of the tank majors are vastly undertuned to the point where getting more raw damage is better since things will die quicker and the damage prevented that way outclasses the damage prevention from certain essences. In Mythic Plus though, I've seen people play with all sorts of options and you're free to do so, except Anima of Life and Death, that essence actually does way more harm than good. For miners, go with Conflict and Strife and Nullification Dynamo for your general purpose. These giving you more reliable tankiness than any major actually. And the last pot you can fill with Formless Void when raiding and Ages of the Deep in dungeons. You might have noticed a theme here when it comes to gearing your blood decay. A theme that is a bit counterintuitive and it goes on even for trinkets and weapons. Yep, choosing your trinkets means strictly going for damage output because blood doesn't scale well with tank trinkets this expansion. In raids you want to go with Cyclotronic Blast and Torment in a Jar. Both are amazing single target damage options and AoE damage options uh, respectively and fairly easy to get considering Torment comes early into the raid. If you end up looting Lingering Psychic Shell from the Zoth, then fuck all else and use it instead of Torment. Right now it's very good and crazy over budgeted at least in the raid itself. In dungeons you want Merekthus Fang and Torment in a Jar again. Merekthus Fang is an amazing AoE damage dealer. It doesn't have a cap on targets hit since it's a dot and not a direct damage dealer so it fills a nice spot into Blood's AoE damage output. For weapons the hands down best in slot is again Getiku Cut of Skill, Cut of Death. That drops from King's Rest. A 430 eye level Getiku seems higher for me than a 445 socketed weapon and a 445 Skjul Vaz. The DK weapon everyone lost their minds about when it was initially revealed. Now it's been nerfed to the ground where the corruption cost puts you at a major loss if you equip it. And we cannot talk weapons without mentioning actual corruption affixes. Keep in mind, all of these are subject to change based on how Blizzard will balance them out as Mythic Nihilotha releases. Right now the top contenders are Echoing Void, Infinite Stars and Twilight Devastation to name a few. Each are good in either single target and AoE and this is without taking into consideration their corruption cost. The higher the corruption cost, the less the damage component can be valued at. Why? Well, because of a few factors. Corruption on blood needs to be managed based on your encounter. If you cannot move a lot or are simply restricted from moving the boss too much because of mechanics, stuff like Toldegore for instance, then you want to have less than 20 corruption to avoid unnecessary damage taken from the eye. Otherwise you can go up as far as 59 corruption, not 60. Meaning the corruption debuffs is something to consider so judge your limits wisely. And speaking of corruption, hey, you should check our second channel, This Is Living. We do mostly live and unedited and unscripted videos about topics, discussions, generally good vibes and behind the scenes type videos. It's not going to take anything away from our general WoW content, but there might be something that you could be interested in. So check it out, we already have a couple of videos out. When opening on a boss, start with your pre-pot, if any, then taunt the boss from afar and move towards it as you channel Blood Drinker. Just before the boss hits you, pop Dancing Rune Weapon and hit Marrow Rent to get double bone shield stacks and follow it up with Blood Boil. The idea behind this opener is to make sure you don't get chunked on the first hit by having a bunch of parry and to instantly get 6 stacks of bone shield since Dancing Rune Weapon duplicates certain abilities. Marrow Rent and Blood Boil being two of them. After this you continue with the priority system. The most important ability to keep up is Marrow Rend if your bone shield will expire by your next GCD. Death Strike next to prevent runic power capping or your blood shield from expiring. If you have the bloody rune blade trait, pop Death and Decay next if the Crimson Scourge procced in the last 3 seconds, otherwise ignore this step. Use Blood Drinker down the priority list as long as you don't have to break the channel with any other ability. Use Blood Boil if you are capping on charges or enemies don't have Blood Plague on them. 
Next up, mana rent if you are at 7 or fewer stacks, or 6 or fewer stacks with Bones of the Damned trait. Keep in mind that during Dancing Rune Weapon you don't want to mana rent if you are not below 5 stacks of Bone Shield. If you are fighting multiple targets, cast Death and Decay next, and if not, just ignore this step. Use Heart Strike next to always keep at least 3 runes regenerating without endangering yourself for not being able to cast Marorant which needs 2 runes. Next, cast Blood Boil if you're in the Dancing Rune Weapon window. Use Death and Decay if you have a Crimson Scourge proc regardless of Azerite traits and finish with Blood Boil. The priority list is just that, a hierarchical order of abilities to be used based on certain conditions that may occur during a fight. It will mostly come down to your judgement and practice of the spec to optimize every global pressed. When playing in dungeons and usually in situations where you pull trash pack after trash pack, you want to keep in mind that being on low or no runic power and no bone shields will make you incredibly squishy and force you to make bad decisions. Try to plan ahead, especially in high mythic plus dungeons, and save runic power and bone shields so you have them up before entering the combat with the next pack. Saving runic power and marrow rending the last dying mob or boss is one way to make sure you have the resources for the next next pool. Runic power is the most important thing to manage to make sure you can always death strike while in a pinch. Don't waste Marorant since the 2 runes it costs can be used for 2 hard strikes instead, netting you more runic power per rune spent and almost an entire death strike. Blood Boil is a good DPS tool, but it also works in the hemostasis mechanic. Like mentioned in the talent section, when you get more comfortable with the spec you can start to manage this as well. As mentioned before, this guide was fact-checked and feedbacked by none other than Mandel, one of the biggest voices in the Bloody Cake community, a theory crafter, analyst and a very smart little cookie that helped us with making this guide. And he also has some online resources you can check. Mandel and not only the Accurate Discord channel have amazing resources for you guys to check if you want a more in-depth approach to blood because there's only so much we can actually put in a video here. So thank you Mandel and thank you Accurus. We love you guys. And also thank you to our dear Patreons, because of you guys, Marcella now has money to drink and fuck bit <coughs> to feed his kids and his dog and if he has time, his wife as well. With his d If you want to support us, check the link down below the video so you can check our Patreon and maybe some rewards that we have in store for you. Thank you for watching the video and see you in the next one.